Hi there, it's Florence here and today I'm back again with another video. For once this isn't really a knitting podcast, although it's kind of knitting podcast adjacent. For a long time now I've been promising a video series on sock knitting. I knit a lot of socks, especially in the last year or two. And so this series is going to contain a variety of different videos. This is going to be the first episode in the series and this is going to be a sort of overview of sock knitting, especially aimed at beginners. I'm going to talk about things like the materials that I use, the yarn that I recommend, and also the different construction methods that I use when I'm knitting socks. There'll also be some information on things like figuring out what size to knit, and on how to care for your hand knit socks. Since this will be a little bit of a longer video, I will have timestamps in the description, so feel free to skip to the chapter that you're interested in. The rest of the videos in this series will hopefully, I think, consist of at least a tutorial for knitting a sock from beginning to end, much in the same style as my jumper tutorial last year. I will be including a tutorial to knit a lace sock, and then there will also be hopefully multiple videos where I'm reviewing some of the sock yarn that I've used. A fun fact about me is that all of the socks that I've knitted within the last year have been knitted with different sock yarn. So for the pairs that I've been wearing for a year, I think I have figured out enough about that yarn and how it wears to be able to make a reasonable review on it. And so I will be uh, posting some reviews of some of these yarns. I did make a post on my Instagram stories where I asked people what kind of questions they would like me to answer in this video. And I feel like the best introduction to this sock knitting series is to talk a little bit about why you might want to knit socks. I have had a lot of people say, you know, why bother knitting something that you're going to wear on your feet that is likely to wear out quite quickly and also something that you can buy so cheaply anyway. Hand knit socks are pretty different from the socks that you generally buy at a store. At least for me, um, especially when the weather is colder, I find them much more comfortable to wear. I like sock knitting because firstly, it's a very portable project. I like the fact that you're only ever going to be carrying around one ball of yarn and one pair of needles, so it's very compact and easy to throw into your bag when you're traveling around and you want a project to take with you. As well as that, I find the resulting uh, sock is super useful. I wear hand knit socks pretty much every day. Well, right now it's sort of going over 30 degrees ish here, and maybe at this point I am sometimes not wearing my hand knit socks. But when I came to uni this term, I brought like two pairs of sports socks, and then apart from that, um, just my big box of hand knit socks. A couple more things I like about sock knitting, aside from the usefulness of the finished product, is well, firstly, it tends to be very affordable. You can knit pretty much all of your socks on the same pair of needles, so you only really need to buy one pair, as long as you find the pair that works well for you. And then every project really just takes 100 grams or less of yarn. Compared to the many hundreds of grams you might need to knit a jumper, that makes each project super budget friendly, even though they still take quite a while to knit. And on top of that, I have, I think, a fairly boring taste in fashion. I'm not going to wear very elaborate, colourful, um, colour work or cabled or lace garments all of the time, and so sock knitting is a really fun way to practice uh, techniques that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily use for a garment, because I don't mind having something a little bit more interesting to wear on my feet, you know? Okay, so now I've spoken a little bit about why I choose to knit my own socks, the next thing I'm going to talk about is choice of yarn. I think that this is something that trips up a lot of beginners, and it's also something that I feel I know quite a bit about through trial and error. I have had unsuccessful yarn choices that have harmed some of the socks I've worked so hard on. But basically, if you're going to put multiple weeks into working on a pair of socks, you want it to be a pair of socks that's going to last. So when it comes to picking sock yarn, what I would first and foremost recommend is go for something that's about 75 to 80% wool and 20% nylon. It's the kind of classic sock yarn that you can't go wrong with. I would say that specifically some of my top recommendations for a hard wearing sock yarn that I have really enjoyed working with, something like Regia. This pair of socks is knitted with a yarn from Opal that fits that description. And I would say that my top recommendation for a really affordable hard wearing sock yarn, if you can find it near you, um, is this one. This is West Yorkshire Spinners Signature Full Ply. I like this one from West Yorkshire Spinners because not only is it a really nice balance of wool and nylon, but it also does contain specific breed wool that is a little bit more hard wearing. It has a certain percentage of blue face Leicester in it, which I think is a really popular choice for people who want to make a slightly more hard wearing pair of socks. I will say though that the colour selection available from West Yorkshire Spinners is a little bit lacking, at least for the kind of colours that I like to work with. 
A lot of people also enjoy working with a superwash merino yarn. Again, I would strongly recommend going for one with at least 20% nylon in. I know that a lot of merino yarn is marketed as sock yarn, despite not having nylon content in it, and I would say skip that altogether. Well, it's probably nice for another project, but I wouldn't go for it for socks. If you're looking for a bit of a softer merino based sock yarn, um, one that I really enjoy the colour selection of and I know that it's very popular is for Kalana Arbeta. This is the oldest pair of socks in this box and they're wearing pretty okay I think. With that being said, I do definitely find that my merino nylon blend socks pill a lot more than my other sort of generic wool and nylon blend socks. I know that some people don't like using nylon for socks. I think a lot of people don't like the idea of having plastic in their hand knit socks, they worry that it's bad for the environment, or they just don't like it texturally. Now, a lot of this depends on what you're going to be using your socks for. Actually, minor tangent, this whole video is going to be full of opinion, okay? Sock knitting is a very personal thing when it comes to the materials you use, the techniques you use, a lot of it is trial and error and finding what works for you specifically. And for me, I wear my socks every day and I wear them with shoes that are not easy on the socks at all. I wear Dot Martens most days, um, like the platform Dot Martens, and so if my socks don't have any nylon in, they will just get holes in them. However, a lot of people don't do that with their socks, they choose to only wear them inside the house, and so it doesn't matter so much whether there's a high nylon content in their socks. There are some sock yarns that are nylon free, but they're also specifically still made for socks. Often these will be made of a slightly harder wearing wool, or spun a little bit more tightly than other fingering weight yarn. One of these yarns that is very popular is Mondim from Retrosaria. This is a 100% wool yarn, but it's still designed for socks. I did not have a lot of success with this particular yarn. Um, I wore through these socks in probably about five wears, which is definitely a shame when it's a pair of socks I'd worked for weeks on. I do like these socks texturally, um, but I think I'm just not about that nylon free sock life, you know? A lot of people really love the Mondim, so maybe, maybe it is just me. Rather than being 100% wool, there are also sock yarns that use different natural fibres to reinforce the yarn instead of nylon. I haven't tried these yet, um, but I'm going to and I'm really intrigued. This is onion nettle sock. This has 30% nettle fibre in it in an attempt to make the wool stronger. I've heard mixed reviews on it, but I'm going to give it a go. And I recently got this one, um, I guess add this was sent to me as a gift from uh, Whistlebear. This is called Cuthbert Sock and this one is... 80% mohair and 20% Wensleydale wool. Mohair is definitely stronger than wool generally is, and so it can be used to reinforce sock yarn. On a related note, if you have a yarn that you would like to use to knit a pair of socks, and it is not a well-reinforced uh, sock yarn, and you don't think it's going to stand up to the wear it's going to experience, something that you can do is hold it with some silk mohair. Both silk and mohair are pretty strong, and so you can knit up DK weight socks by holding the main strand that might not be strong enough on its own, with a strand of silk mohair. These make super cosy winter socks that you can knit up at a DK gauge, and it definitely does help with the wear. So, the majority of sock yarn is four ply, and I guess to summarise my overall advice when choosing it, I would say look for a fingering or four ply weight yarn that is advertised as a sock yarn, and which contains at least 20% nylon, and the rest being wool. That wool could be just unspecified wool, or it could be merino, or even some alpaca, whatever you like the texture of the most. However, you can totally knit up DK weight socks, and I still find them pretty wearable. They make for a much quicker project, you can knit up a pair of these in a weekend for sure. It's a little bit harder to find DK weight yarn that contains nylon. Obviously the sock is a little bit thicker, so if you use something that doesn't have nylon in, it will last better than a fingering weight sock which doesn't have nylon in. But there are still great options out there. Um, this was knitted in a yarn from Emma's Yarn, which is a DK with nylon in. And as I said, if you want to knit a DK weight sock, another great option is to use fingering weight sock yarn plus silk mohair. I also wanted to quickly mention um, the colours of yarn that you can get. I suppose the main categories are, uh, you can get a flat, commercially dyed coloured yarn. As you can probably tell from looking at my sock box, this is generally what I go for. I find that these sorts of yarns are really good for showing off patterns, um, any lace or cables that you're knitting. And when I am pairing socks in my outfit, sometimes I want a sock that doesn't look so busy, so it's easy to match with a lot of things. However, if you don't want to knit cables or lace and you still want an interesting looking sock, or even if you just like something that's a little bit more exciting, you can totally pick up a self-striping sock yarn. I don't actually think I have any pairs of socks with me knitted in a self-striping yarn, although I have made a few. 
There are even yarns which give a really cool ferrile looking finish which kind of resembles colour work. I know West Yorkshire Spinners has a pretty nice range which is designed to look like different birds. And then the other thing that a lot of people like to go for is a hand dyed sock yarn. These seem to come especially frequently in the merino nylon variety, sort of 75 to 80% seaport merino and the rest being nylon. I do like a hand dyed sock yarn, although I tend to go for one that's a little bit less busy, especially if I'm going to be doing a complicated design, so that design does end up showing up. But yes, I think I use a lot less hand dyed sock yarn than a lot of people, but it's definitely a very popular option to go for. It is a lot more expensive, I think 100 grams of a hand dyed sock yarn is likely to set you back somewhere between 20 and 30 pounds, whereas 100 grams of a commercially dyed sock yarn could be as cheap as 3 or 4 pounds, um, or up to about 10 to 15. Okay, so the next thing that you're going to need if you want to knit some socks is a set of needles. Now, I wish I had all of these different needles available to show you the various types, but I have been decluttering and I have thrown out all but the needles that I really use to knit socks. So I'll just have to speak a little bit about them and um, yeah, hopefully that's okay. I would say that the three most common methods used for knitting socks are firstly, double pointed needles something that a lot of people uh, learned from older family members, it's becoming less popular I suppose. It's classic, I just find it fiddly to have so many needles in my project at once, and I think some people find it a little bit difficult to uh, get rid of the ladders between the needles. An advantage of double pointed needles is that you can knit the whole sock just with double pointed needles, you don't need anything else, so you can just have one needle set. Now another method that shares this advantage is my preferred method, which is magic loop. So to do magic loop I just use one set of needles with um, a longer cable between them. These are the Chiaogu circular needles, I like to use an 80cm length magic loop, and these are the needles that I knit all of my socks on. I have got rid of all of my other sock needles, I gave them to other people who wanted to try them out, because this is what works best for me. Now some things that I like about magic loop, as I said, you don't need to use any other needles to be able to do the heel or the toe or anything like that, which is nice. I also find that the way that you arrange your stitches on Magic Loop is very intuitive and sort of fits the construction of the sock. So you'll have half of your stitches on one needle and half of your stitches on the other needle. And this is useful because it naturally separates the stitches into say the back of the leg and the front of the leg or the inset stitches and the heel stitches. And so you can work without stitch markers really just using the position of the stitches on the needle to figure out where you are in the route. A lot of patterns are written for one particular uh, type of needles, it's generally pretty easy to switch between them, but I do especially like patterns that are written specifically for Magic Loop, and so that's how my patterns are written. Another very popular type of needle to use for sock knitting is the tiny circular needle. I have tried these in the past, I think I've given all of my sets away, um, but they're basically maybe 23 centimeter circular needles, so the cable is really short. So you basically knit in the round, just on tiny circular needles without using magic loop. I find that this hurts my hands, and I know a lot of people feel the same way, but an advantage of this is if you have trouble getting ladders between the stitches when you are using double pointed needles or magic loop, this is likely to be less of an issue with tiny circulars. Something else that I think tiny circulars are really great for is colour work. If you are a little bit less practiced with colour work and you want to knit colour work socks, it can be tricky dealing with the tension of the floats, um, where the stitches are transferred between different needles, and so with tiny circulars this isn't an issue. For me the other downside of tiny circulars is that you can't knit the whole sock on just your tiny circulars. You will have to switch for something else to knit, say, the toe, and you will have to have another needle to hand to knit the heel I guess as well. So if you want a super compact sock knitting project it's probably not the best needle type to use. Anyway, there are definitely people who swear by all three of these different needle setups, and there are totally others around as well. I know some people like to knit socks on two sets of circular needles. I know that some people like to use, um, they're kind of like a fusion between double pointed needles and circular needles, like tiny circular needles with a little cable in between them. I think Haya Haya does a version of them. Really just try out a couple of things and figure out what works best for you, but when in doubt I would suggest starting with Magic Loop, just because it's what I've found works best for me and I now won't use anything else. The other thing that I will mention when it comes to choosing needles is your choice of needle size. I don't know much about American needle sizes, so I will be giving sizes in millimetres, which I guess is what's most commonly used in Europe. So for me, I knit all of my socks on a 2.25mm needle. You can also use a 2.5mm needle. I do have quite a few pairs I knitted in the past on a 2.5mm needle, and they do knit up noticeably more quickly. 
depending on the yarn you're using, it can be a little bit large um, and the socks can end up looking a bit less neat. And also the larger the needle size you use, the less well the socks will wear. Knitting your socks up at a tighter gauge will definitely give a sturdier sock as well as one that looks a little bit prettier too. I know a lot of people like to go down to a 2mm needle as well, which is totally something that you can do. I have larger feet so sizes don't tend to go large enough for me to go down to a really small needle size. I think 2.25 is the sweet spot for me and it's where I would probably recommend you start. Although if you'd like to knit socks up a little bit more quickly initially, the 2.5mm might work for you. Generally a pattern will recommend a specific needle size, but once you have some sense of how many stitches work for you, um, then you can switch to whatever needle size you prefer using without too much trouble. For DK weight socks, I like to use a 3mm needle. Again, patterns will vary with what they ask you to do. Now in terms of other equipment that you might need to knit socks, firstly you might need some different stitch markers to the ones that you generally use when you're knitting. The needles are so tiny and the yarn is so thin that if you use a really chunky stitch marker it may lead to some inconsistencies in the resulting fabric. But I find that these little light bulb metal stitch markers that are always very cheap or even come for free on clothing, they work great for socks. And besides, I don't really use them very often for a top-down sock, a cuff-down sock, I don't use stitch markers at all most of the time, and even if it's toe-up I only use maybe two. The other piece of sort of specialist sock equipment that you'll see a lot of people using um, is a sock blocker, so something like this. Mine is this green wire metal one, which is pretty ugly, um, but it does, it does work well. It's uh, hollow, or just the outline, so it gets a lot of airflow through it, which helps the socks dry quickly. I'll put a sock on it so that you can see, but I think basically the idea is that the first time you wash and dry your socks, you can put it onto the blocker like this to dry. So it will dry quickly, but it will also dry in a pretty sock shape, because socks tend to look a little bit funny right after you've knitted them, especially if they're ribbed socks or lace or something like that. And so the sock blocker can help give a Instagram ready <laughs> shape to your socks. You don't need one of these. You can totally just block your socks without a sock blocker at all, just like you would a jumper, and even if you do want to shape your socks and make them look all pretty, like you would with this, um, well, there was a long period last year when I blocked all of my socks on a sock blocker that I made myself. I used a cardboard box measured to the size that I wanted, cut out a foot shape, and then I covered it in cling film. And I made six pairs of socks using that before it started getting a little bit soggy and I kind of needed to replace it. At that point I justified replacing my sock blocker, um, but you could totally have just made another cardboard one and it works totally fine. I kind of miss my cardboard sock blocker. It served me very well. I guess what I'm saying is, other than the uh, needles, there probably isn't anything else that you need to buy to knit socks that you don't already have from knitting other projects. And if you are buying materials from scratch, you can pretty much get started with like a needle, scissors, a pair of knitting needles, maybe something to measure, a ruler, I don't know. It's definitely a more affordable way to get started than knitting a jumper which takes four sets of needles and a kilo of yarn. Okay, so now I'm going to speak a little bit about methods of constructing socks. To be honest, my advice for a beginner would be to try a bunch of patterns by different designers that use very different techniques, so that you can try out a few things and figure out what works best for you, because definitely different people find different construction methods are their preferred methods to use. I do recommend both of the 52 Weeks of Socks books, I really enjoyed them and they have a really wide variety of socks designed by a lot of different designers. So a lot of them use different construction methods and techniques. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to address is whether you want to knit your socks cuff down or toe up. These are the two main ways to knit socks. There are obviously other ways. I know a lot of socks are knitted horizontally and seamed or something like that, but generally cuff down and toe up are the two common methods you'll find. I have definitely knitted a bunch of socks using both methods, probably a pretty equal number with each. These are the Kaisler socks from 52 Weeks of Socks and these are knitted cuff down. And these are the Humu Humu socks by Yuka and these are knitted toe up. To knit a pair of socks toe up, you end up casting on stitches on the toe using some kind of cast on, um, either a magic cast on or a Turkish cast on generally, and then you work them from this direction upwards and bind off at the top. Whereas for a cuff down sock like this, you cast on at this top edge, knit down, and then kitchen a stitch to seam the toe. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to both methods. Firstly, the toe up sock. I think the biggest advantage of this method is that you can use up exactly the amount of yarn that you want to use up. 
say you have 60 grams of yarn left or 50 grams single skein and you want to use up all of it but you don't want to run out when you're working on the second sock you can divide the yarn into two equal weight balls and then keep on going until you run out um, and just sort of finish there so that you know you'll have exactly the right amount left in it for the second sock with a cuff down sock it is a lot harder to use up exactly the right amount of the yarn because you need to knit it to your foot length whereas for a tie up sock it's the leg length which doesn't matter so much that you end up adjusting Another reason people really like toe-up socks is because when they're using the heel flap and gusset type of heel, which I will discuss when I talk about heel types in a second, they don't have to pick up stitches on the side of the heel flap. This is valid, um, but I don't really like how the side of the heel flap looks when you knit socks toe-up, so that doesn't really bother me too much. For me, the big con of knitting toe-up socks is the bind-off. It's very easy to do a really nice looking, very elastic cast on, which gives a really stretchy but neat looking top edge to your socks. But when you knit them toe up, I find it's very hard to bind off in a way that doesn't have this top edge look a little bit messy. I find that generally it tends to flare out a bit and it's hard to bind off loosely enough or with, with a stretchy enough method to get it over my foot very comfortably. With some practice I found some methods work better than others, I currently like doing a surprisingly stretchy bind off on my top socks, but I do still find that it looks a lot less pretty than the top edge of a cuff down sock. In comparison, you can see there is no flaring out on this sock at all. This is one of my oldest pairs of socks and it looks totally neat and is as stretchy as I need it to be. So I suppose that means that for a cuff down sock, the pros are it's easy to have a nice stretchy cast on edge and they look very neat and the cons are that if you're using a heel flap and gusset, you may have to pick up stitches along the side of the heel flap and also it's hard to figure out exactly how much yarn to use if you're trying to use it all up. So next I will speak a little bit about heel constructions. I will speak about, I suppose, the three most common heel constructions, but there are certainly loads more. I will first of all talk about my preferred heel construction, which is the heel flap and gusset. This is easy to do on a cuff down or a tarp sock. The way it works is you have a heel flap here, which you very often add slip stitches to, to add a little bit of reinforcement to the heel, since it is an area that gets a lot of wear, especially if you wear your socks with shoes. And then you pick up stitches along the side of the heel flap and decrease them out again in this section, which is called the gusset. So I suppose some pros of this heel type are, you can use it to create a very deep heel. If you have quite a high instep, you might find that this is a method that allows you to create really comfortable socks. It's also very easy to add this reinforced slip stitch section. So if your socks are going to get a lot of wear, um, this can really help them last, at least in that area. There's nothing really stopping you from putting slip stitch sections on other parts of the sock, but this is a really good standard place to start. I also find that they give a really neat look as well. And I say this is probably the most common heel construction that you're going to come across. Um, it appears in a lot of different patterns. When it comes to the slip stitches, there are a lot of different types of slip stitch patterns that you can use on a, a sock. This one here uses the eye of partridge heel, which looks pretty subtle. I tend to just do a regular slip stitch heel. And then this one has a little bit more of an unusual slip stitch pattern as well. If you don't find that your socks get a lot of wear in this area, you can also just do stockinette for the heel flap if you don't like the way that the slip stitches on the heel look. Now the next most popular type of heel that I see around is a short row heel. And I do have one pair of socks in this box with a short row heel. I used to knit these all the time a few years ago when I used to make more vanilla socks, but I don't reach for socks with this construction as much anymore. Now, a cool thing about a short row heel like this um, is that it's going to look the most like a commercially bought sock. So if you want to create a really clean finish that looks like a, a sock you'd buy in a shop, this is probably the heel method that you might want to use. Aside from looking really clean, um, it also is very easy to knit and very seamless and easy to integrate into the pattern. Even though I am talking about this, like one type of heel option, um, there are actually a lot of different ways of doing a short row heel. I find that a German short row heel is really easy to do, but there are other types as well. I'm not sure what this one is called. Uh, the fish lips kiss heel is also a super popular one. It's a very cheap pattern on Ravelry and I, I've used that one before and I think it gives a nice looking heel as well. The problem with this construction for me is that I don't find it gives me enough room in the heel. I like to have quite a roomy heel, this doesn't really give it, and so the sock ends up being more stretched over the top of my foot, which can kind of make the pattern look a bit weird if I've worked really hard on some lace or some cables and it ends up being stretched out. Anyway, a lot of people totally swear by short row heels. They are something that I will knit from time to time, but not something that I'll reach for. 
The other type of heel which is super popular and which I don't have to show you today, although again I have used it in the past, is an afterthought heel. This is basically done by knitting a plain tube and then at the end you can sort of cut a slit into the sock and pick up stitches on either side of that slit to put the heel in. Now something really cool about an afterthought heel is firstly, as I was saying before, how you might want to use up all of some yarn that you have. An afterthought heel is great for that. You can literally just take a ball of yarn that's really special and you really like and you want to use up all of, and you can just knit a great long tube with nothing attached to it until you run out of yarn. And then you can go ahead and cut that tube into pieces and use those pieces to make socks. If you're a little bit worried about cutting into the sock, worried that you might drop stitches and make a mess, you can put some yarn in while you're knitting the sock so that those stitches are held and it's easy to see where you want to cut it. I think that this works especially well for self-striping or self-patterning socks. Firstly, it is never going to disrupt the flow of the pattern um, if you're going to do a contrast heel, because it is just a tube that you added it into afterwards. And the other cool thing about it is you can place that heel wherever you want, so you can place it so that it lines up perfectly in between two stripes or whatever, um, whatever you think will work the best. Again, I find that this doesn't give as deep of a heel as I'd like, and I suppose this also applies to the shorter heel. I do find that it wears not quite as well as my reinforced heel flat heels. Now aside from the heels, something else that you can construct in different ways is the sock toe. All of the socks that I have in this box have a regular wedge toe, that is, I increase on every other round, increase four stitches. A lot of people like to do a rounded toe, so changing the rate of the increases or decreases, depending on whether you're knitting it toe up or cuff down, uh, to create more of a rounded finish rather than a uh, wedge shape like this, which is what my socks have. And some people even like to do, uh, I guess they call it an anatomical toe, something that's asymmetric so that your pair of socks have different toes to fit the shape of your foot. I'm not sure if you can really see the wedge toe on any of my socks especially well because they have been blocked and worn and so it's kind of given them a rounded shape eventually after all, but perhaps you can see it just has a very angular wedge shape. It doesn't bother me, but if you want to try out a different uh, construction for your toe you should totally go for it. I do find that sometimes, especially when I'm knitting socks toe up, uh, rounded toes can be a little bit fiddly, increasing on every round, especially at the start, so it's not something that I've done in a while. Now I know I spoke briefly about cast-ons and bind-offs when I was talking about toe-up versus cuff-down socks, but I will speak a little bit more about it because some people had some questions about which cast-ons and bind-offs I use. When I'm knitting socks toe-up, I tend to use a Turkish cast-on. I find it a bit less fiddly than a magic cast-on, even though I do use a magic cast-on for a lot of other knitting projects. It's super easy to do and I find it gives a really nice finish with neat corners. There's no sort of loopiness at the corners, which I sometimes got with the magic cast on. Then for the bind off at the top, I generally nowadays use a surprisingly stretchy bind off. I like the fact that it works well with any stitch pattern, so if you're doing a 2x2 two two rib or a 1x1 one one rib or twisted rib or anything, a surprisingly stretchy bind off can give a really neat finish to all of them. And it's also the method that I found makes the top of my socks flare out the least. Although if you have another method that you would like to recommend, do leave it in the description and I will give it a go. For cuff down socks, this is my hot take of the video, I just use a long tail cast on. There are loads of different cast on methods that you can do, uh, like a German twisted cast on. These are specially designed to be extra stretchy to the top of a sock, but I've just never had a problem with using a regular long tail cast on on the same size needle that I use for the rest of the sock. Even when I'm missing socks with small stitch counts that are definitely too small for me, the cast on edge has never been insufficiently stretchy. To be honest, I think I use a long tail cast on for pretty much everything that I knit unless I'm casting on in the middle of a round. So that's probably the one that I'd recommend to get started with, just because it is so easy. If you'd like to then branch out to try other cast on methods, you can totally do that. But it's just something that I have never felt the need to change. If it's not broken, don't fix it. It works fine for me. And then obviously for the top down socks, I just use a kitchener stitch to cast off at the toe. The last thing I want to talk about in this sort of sock construction chapter, which I think has become rather long, um, is the number of stitches that you want to use when you're knitting your socks. This is another thing where opinion sort of plays into it a lot. Some people really like a tight sock, some people like a loose sock, some people do cables and lace and don't want the pattern to stretch out at all. Other people like a sock that feels really snug and isn't going to come off when they take their foot out of their boots. It's one of those things where you will probably get more of a sense of the stitch count you like as you knit more pairs of socks. Most patterns will have some guidance. They tell you to measure your foot and have, I don't know, three to five centimeters of negative ease. I think you want to measure kind of around the widest point of your foot and then make sure that the negative ease is enough. And you can totally do it so that you have different stitch counts for the leg and for the foot if that's something that you find that you end up needing. 
With that being said, I have socks with stitch counts everywhere from 56 stitches to 72 stitches, and I think all of them fit me reasonably well. I think that I've found out that for the most part I like my socks to be around 64 stitches, although often 70 or 72 if I'm doing a rib or a complicated cable. But again, it's going to depend a lot on what needle size you're using and what yarn you're using as well. I think the people who have one specific stitch count that they always knit are generally people who knit a lot of vanilla socks because you can find what works for you and then stick with it. But if you're somebody who knits a lot of different styles of socks like me, so I have a lot of lace and a lot of cables, you do have to be a little bit more flexible with the stitch counts you're going to use. Cable socks are generally going to require more stitches as they have a little bit less stretch to them and lace socks are going to stretch out more so you might want fewer stitches. Also a ribbed sock or something like that is likely to be more, I guess, forgiving. It will snap back more so you can knit it a little bit larger and not worry about it being too big as much. Some people asked if I gauge swatch for my socks. To be honest, I don't gauge swatch for socks. If you are a perfectionist, by all means go for it. But they have quite a lot of negative ease to them anyway, so I find that they're pretty forgiving and I've never really struggled with the size. I will say the one major uh, caveat when I say it doesn't ma really matter how many stitches you have, it will probably be fine, is colourwork socks. Colourwork socks you totally have to be more careful with because those floats mean the sock can be a lot less stretchy and I have seen so many people knit whole beautiful elaborate colourwork socks that took them months only to be unable to get the sock on over their foot. Definitely try your socks on as you knit them so that you realise if there's a problem sooner rather than later. And while this video isn't especially focusing on colourwork socks, because I haven't made a lot of them, I know that a lot of people like to knit them inside out, so the floats are on the outside, because that can help uh, make them stretch a little bit more over your foot, because the floats aren't so tight. Okay, so a lot of people ask me how I care for my hand knit socks. Obviously I wear mine every day, so they do definitely see some wear. I think the first thing is manage your expectations. I've had a few messages that are asking how my socks don't felt when I wear them with my Dot Martins or whatever, and my socks do totally felt. Some yarn is worse for it than others. I find that the Alpaca Blend yarn, so something like um, Drops Nord or the Izzia sock yarn, they felt the most for me, but all of my socks that I've worn very heavily do have some felting. So I block my socks the first time that I wash them after I've knitted them, and then I never put them back on a blocker again pretty much. I just let them be the shape that they end up being after I've worn them and washed them. I just like lay them out flat to dry. When I wash my socks, firstly, most sock yarn is superwash. I haven't really touched on it in this video. There is a lot of non-superwash sock yarn out there, but you do mostly have to be looking for it. I prefer non-superwash sock yarn and I find it a little bit hard to track down sometimes. So you can probably put your socks in the washing machine and the dryer, um, but it will mean that the colours fade faster, especially if you're making hand-dyed socks. And I suppose the other part is it will just decrease the lifespan of your socks as well. I don't machine wash any of my hand knit socks. I am not even sure at this point which of these are superwash and which aren't. I wash all of my socks the same way that I wash, well, most of my wardrobe at this point is non-superwash hand knitted, so I end up hand washing pretty much all of my clothes anyway, and so it isn't a big deal to hand wash my socks as well. I basically run a bunch of slightly warm water, not too warm, um, cold water is also fine, you don't want your socks to felt if they are non superwash. And then I just use a wool wash, this one is from Yucalan, it's really cheap. But I don't think it matters too much which one you use. I just leave them to soak, like agitate them a little but not so much that they are going to felt. And then I press out the water and leave them flat to air dry. When it comes to de-pilling my socks, because as well as felting, they do pill, uh, the worst culprits for this are definitely my Superwash Merino socks. The Cascade Heritage pillars horribly for me, especially. I have one of these little um, electric D pillars. Yeah, it has a little spinning blade so you could sort of go over your socks like this and it will help cut off some of the little pills and fuzzy bits. You can totally remove them by hand as well and I know a lot of people like to use a regular razor to D pill their socks. But these things aren't very expensive and so if you own a lot of knitwear I would really recommend one. I use them for my jumpers, my tops, my socks, everything so I definitely have got my money's worth. I did lose one and I totally replaced it because it felt worthwhile to me. The last thing that I want to speak about in terms of caring for your socks is darning them. Now first off everybody is going to have different points on the sock which fail first for them. I know a lot of people uh, have their socks fail on the bottom, so near the ball of the foot here, or on the bottom of the heel. Obviously even with the reinforced heel flaps a lot of people will wear through them here, especially if they're wearing them with shoes. 
for me, I wear through my socks first on the toe. So these are my Momdim socks. Um, I knitted these last year, and as I said, I got holes in the toes within about five wears. Now, darning is something that could have a whole video uh, dedicated to it, and I might do one at some point if I wear through another pair of socks and so I can film a demo, uh, but you can darn really pretty invisibly. You can see this is like double thickness, um, but it's the same stitch pattern. When you go to darn a pair of socks, uh, firstly, make sure that you are thinking about what you're going to use to darn them. It's a nice idea to darn them with the same yarn you knitted them in so that the darning is invisible, but here's the thing. If those socks didn't last very long before the holes appeared, it's maybe not the most productive to darn them with that same yarn because it will likely wear through again. Obviously it's different if it's a sock you've been wearing for years and it's just worn through and it lived a, a good long life, um, but I was not going to be darning this with the Mondeen again because it didn't work out well the first time and it's much harder to darn over the darn. So I, I know the colour match is suspiciously good. This isn't Mondeem. I um, do buy those specific darning wools. You can buy them from yarn shops or sewing shops a lot of the time, and they are like maybe 40 to 50% nylon. There is a lot of nylon in them. So that is going to be a really sturdy repair that is going to last hopefully much longer than the original sock did. They tend to come in small quantities and be very inexpensive, which makes them great for stuff like repairing socks. I think they're about a pound to a pound fifty for each of them, and you can definitely repair quite a few socks with each. The other thing I want to mention with darning is like preventative darning versus using darning to repair a sock. So I haven't worn these socks in a while because I did darn this one. This one had a full on hole in the toe and I, I have darned it. But when I wore through this one, I did look really closely at this one to see if I could spot where it was starting to fail. And sure enough, this is not going to show up on camera, so I won't even bother showing you, but you can see on this sock the point where the yarn is becoming really thin and where it would break in the same way that this one did. So when you get to that point, I would really suggest using some of that darning wool and duplicate stitching over the stitches in that area where it's failing. It is much, much easier to repair a sock by duplicate stitching over existing stitches when they're a bit delicate but not yet failed than it is to patch a big hole invisibly. So definitely when you see it starting to wear thin, and I would recommend checking often, especially if it's a yarn that you don't entirely trust, like this one that's nylon free, um, keep an eye open for it and spot when it's getting a little bit thin and jump in then because it's so much easier. Now obviously I like that sort of mostly invisible duplicate stitch looking darn, but there are totally other methods out there, you can look into it, there are more woven looking repairs you can do to your socks. Um, just research online and there are lots of good tutorials. Maybe I'll film one at some point, I need to wear through another pair of socks first so I have something to repair. Okay, so I think that's just about it for this video. I hope it wasn't too chaotic and I didn't cover too much ground. And I'm hoping you picked up some tips for knitting your own socks. If you have any more questions, you can feel free to leave them in the comments. I am by no means a sock knitting expert, but I am someone who's knitted quite a lot of socks and wears them every day. So I do feel like I can give a little bit of advice maybe to beginners. And I'm really looking forward to filming the sock knitting tutorial. Oh, I can show it to you. I've only knitted one of them because the other one I will be knitting on camera for the tutorial, but this is the lace sock that I will be showing how to knit um, for a tutorial as part of this video series. So do subscribe if you want to see more sock knitting content, it's one of the big uh, categories of content I would like to work on this summer, and so uh, there will definitely be a lot more. Thank you very much for watching and goodbye!